The alarm is growing more urgent and spreading farther across Canada. Fentanyl, highly addictive and sometimes deadly, is now a top priority across the country. But where it first showed up in Vancouver, it is an epidemic and an overwhelming crisis. So in this special full edition, W5's John Woodward and the CTV News Vancouver team hit the streets with doctors, first responders, social workers and addicts for a first-hand look at the crisis and the often desperate search for solutions. This is the face Vancouver presents to the world, a coastal metropolis. But roughly two kilometers from the bright lights of the skyscrapers is a neighborhood wrestling with darkness, the downtown east side. It's the end of the line for Canada's down and out and the heart of Canada's opioid crisis. Drug overdoses killed nearly a thousand people in this province last year. In this city, someone dies almost every day. This intersection is Maine and Hastings, but drug users call it pain and wastings. And just steps away, we find Patricia and Jessica. It's cold, man. They've invited us into their world to witness their nightly routine, shooting drugs. Except for the wind. Patricia is 32. She calls this area home. She's a mother of four, but she hasn't seen her kids in a while. They're 11, 10, 9, and 4. Where are they now? They live with my dad. Drug use, you know, has really, really ruined my life in more ways than one, in ways that are permanent. Wow, is it ever cold? The young women think they're about to shoot heroin, but they can't know for sure. I just put some in here. Synthetic opioids are being cut into street drugs all across Canada. They are incredibly strong and very cheap. Here, what they think is heroin is more likely to be one of its much more powerful cousins, fentanyl or carfentanyl. Drugs tainted with a dose of carfentanyl as small as a single grain of salt can kill. <laughs> Give me your goddamn Narcan, kid. Someone's Seriously, dying. Seriously, I've heard <laughs> you know? no word of a lie. I have legitimately... Like, no, this is for my life. <laughs> I have legitimately, yes, heard people turn down their Narcan kit <laughs> and say, no, I'm sorry. Like, too bad this life's to live in today. <laughs> they joke about Narcan, the opioid antidote that could save their lives. Doesn't it bother you that you could be overdosing in the next one? You don't know what's in it? Oh, absolutely. It petrifies me. So why keep doing it? Okay, I don't know how better I can describe this, but you know how you would never hurt your children? Like, I would never hurt my children. They're, I love them more than I love myself. I love them more than anything in this world, and I would do anything for them. That's how hard it is to come off of this drug. Sorry, okay? Patricia remains calm, but whatever Jessica has put into her system is taking hold. How long have you been using heroin? I've been using heroin for about two years. Two years. Uh, was four months of that was clean time. So it's been a pretty rough couple of years for myself. I was homeless for most of the time. Uh, I lost my husband for 13 years. Um, so that was really hard. Go ahead, hon. something, but hey. <laughs> Jessica's behavior is becoming erratic. Her body is contorting. She's losing control over her movements. Would, like I've seen grown men overdose in front of me off the same shot that I just did. But the way the heroin is and where it's cut, you don't know how much you're getting. It's an uncomfortable scene. But this is normal for Patricia and Jessica. This is the reality of street drugs. Fentanyl has found its way into knockoff prescription painkillers, into party drugs and cocaine. People are overdosing across the country. And it's not just killing addicts, it's killing teenagers in suburban neighborhoods 
just out to have a good time. Overdoses killed at least 1,400 Canadians last year. Unprecedented numbers in what has become a coast-to-coast -coast epidemic. A real-time crisis is unfolding, an all-time high in the number of drug overdoses. She went from being perfectly healthy to found dead on the family's bathroom floor. You take just a couple of grains too much and you're, you're gonna become a statistic. And those statistics are grim. On average, more than two people in this province die a day from an overdose. And in this city, it's likely that someone will die tonight. A reality paramedic Brian Twaits knows all too well. The call volume is just astronomical now with the amount of overdoses that we're seeing. Overdoses that happen so often, the BC Ambulance Service created a specialized unit just to respond to the most urgent cases. That's Brian's job today. How many people would you see in a day? Maybe 10, 50. It, it really depends again on the day, but there's been shifts where I've done 26 responses in a, in a 12 hour period. 26 different overdoses. Yeah, and that's just my vehicle alone too. So the numbers last year are almost a thousand deaths, yeah. I understand. Amazing, tragic. And today the stakes are even higher. It's called Welfare Wednesday, the day government assistance money goes into people's bank accounts. It happens once a month. At 9 a.m., this Hastings Street Bank opens and there's more money on the street and a lot more drugs. For Brian Twaits, Welfare Wednesday means a 40% increase in call volume, meaning today he's much more likely to be called to an overdose that kills. It stops you from breathing and Sometimes, especially with the potency of like the fentanyl that's coming out into the streets, it's instantaneous. You know, for somebody who's never seen it before, it's frightening. They're, they're blue because they're cyanotic due to the lack of oxygen. They're not breathing. It, it, it looks like they're trying to breathe. They're gasping. They're completely unconscious. And the big thing is, is their brain cells are dying. It's just like holding your breath for that long. You bet. Exactly. And so, and so when they stop breathing, They've only got, what, a few minutes? Well, depending on the books you read, four to six minutes until you can, you know, lapse into cardiac arrest. It's a frightening scenario playing out all over Vancouver. <laughs> 11 a.m., paramedics respond to a call. A young man isn't breathing. It's an overdose. Martin Gaudet saw it happen. This is the first time I'm meeting this guy, so to see him overdose like that, it's, just, it's devastating. A close call, but paramedics got there in time. The patient brought back from the brink with Narcan. That's the heroin antidote. But it didn't come from the paramedics. It came from other people on the street. I have saved up to four lives already, myself. Um, it's, it's not an easy job, you know, if, if that's... How did you save them? Uh, I injected Narcan. Martin is among many who carry their own Narcan kits to save other lives, and maybe one day his own. Martin is a user too. I use uh, fentanyl, I use heroin, which is a big part of my life. I have OD'd once, yeah. That's how I lost my leg. My leg was uh, run over by a bus. Why do you use fentanyl when you know it could kill you? Uh, it's, it's like a warm hug. You just, you, you, when you need a warm hug, that's, that's the best way to get the warm hug, right? Whatever their reason is for using, every injection can have dramatic consequences. <coughs> and by 2.45 p.m., first responders start seeing the overdose calls come in fast. Firefighters and paramedics are dispatched to this alley. There's a man down near Hastings and Abbott Streets. The local fire hall doesn't spend much time fighting fires anymore. 70% of their calls are medical, which includes overdoses. It's 12 hours, 10 hours of my shift, right? So the way I look at it is I just get through it. That's all you can do. The workload has Captain Darren Fairburn and others burning out. It's frustrating, it's, it's scary, it's an eye-opener for sure, even for me after 22 years, it's, uh, it's pretty sad. It's, kind of like it's not sustainable, it can't keep going on like this. 
The man survives. He's taken away in an ambulance. 20 minutes later, another OD call. You clear one call and you go to the next one. It's crazy. <laughs> we do, I've been in this 18 years and the number of calls that we do a shift is like doubled e easily. The increase in overdose calls is being felt system wide. Right up, right up if you want. Thanks, guys. Yeah. You see anything? Not yet. All emergency responders dealing with an increased workload. This on top of their usual 911 responsibilities. Paramedics like Brian Twaits still have to go to all of the other calls. It's all a big team down here. Uh, the fire department, uh, first responders are on the call. Uh, the primary care paramedic team's on the call. An advanced life support unit's also sent when the priority level is high, uh, for example, in a drug overdose. By the time the sun sets on Wednesday, the area Brian covers has seen 23 overdose cases. And as night falls and users flood the streets and alleys of Vancouver's downtown east side, the tone begins to change. Tango 3, go ahead. Tango 3, arrest on your cat. It's Brian's first call after dark to the heart of the downtown east side, Maine and Hastings. And it comes with a warning to our film crew. This might be a little chaotic for you guys to uh, show up and get out at. Okay, just so, you know. so I'm, th I'm just thinking of your safety at this call because it's turning into nighttime and it's on the street. This is ground zero. Brian is concerned for our safety. He insists that we remain in the vehicle. Yeah, he's waking up, they've given him Narcan. Yeah. Okay. Narcan bought this man time, enough to stay alive until the emergency crews got there. Turns out it was an overdose. They were ventilating him and they had gotten some Narcan into him just as the other paramedic crew showed up. And when we got here, the other crew said they're good. The Guys waking up and they don't need our assistance, so that's great. A great example of everybody uh, working on uh, fighting this crisis and trying to keep people alive, right? Very nice. Yeah, it feels really nice. But off the street and in the dark alley, tucked away from the busy streets and the eyes of the community, it's just us watching Patricia and Jessica. Oh, sorry, They've injected drugs, and things are going from bad to worse for Jessica. Hi, Mom. How's it going? Can we take a lean? Jessica's drug trip is taking a turn. She's twisting, dancing, flailing. She's losing control. See, I've never flailed ever in my drug addiction. I don't know why some do and some don't, you know? What does it feel like for you? To be honest with you, I feel normal. And then it gets even worse for Jessica. She's on the ground. She's not moving. Patricia's friend is in trouble. She rushes to her side to check if she's even breathing. She's lucky that Patricia was there for her. It could have been a lot worse. Nearly a thousand drug users died in this province last year, many within blocks of this spot. The relentless calls for help. We're going to another overdose. For frontline caregivers. Hey, Sport, how you doing? When W5 continues. Tango 3. 6.15 p.m. Tango 3. It's a busy night for emergency crews in Vancouver's downtown east side. Paramedic Brian Twaits handles the most serious drug overdose calls, and they are coming in quickly. This one, barely two minutes after his last response. Possible overdose or cardiac arrest, and it's in a downtown alley. The address is in an alley, one of many in a maze of downtown streets. The epicenter of Canada's opioid drug crisis is here concentrated in roughly 10 square city blocks. Alley after alley of doorways, dumpsters, fire escapes, parking garages. 
Just knowing the area and knowing some addresses, I'm thinking it might be in a different alley. You guys see anything? Fire there walking around. This is the other ambulance that was just here. Gets to be a little bit of a, a hunt, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Right? And a lot of the time you have people who don't know where they are. And that makes things difficult. The alleys can be confusing. In the darkness, the crews are having trouble finding their patient. Because this is a, a little spot where guys like to go and hide. Tango three. I've done the alley, and I don't see anything here either. With no sign of a patient, the search is abandoned. There are more lives to save. And minutes later, another call. We're going to another overdose. It's on the street. It's in front of a shelter. It's an overdose a few blocks away. The man is sprawled out on the sidewalk. He's not breathing. He needs oxygen. And if he doesn't get the antidote Narcan, he could die. This man saw him collapse. They ran to him and helped him. Now I can. That's just what you got to do. You got to be quick. It's, it's like, it's not, it's a reflex. But the man is still unconscious. The situation is critical. The drugs in his system could still do a lot of damage. So it looks like it's an active resuscitation. That's why dispatch has called for Brian's expertise. Hey guys. His eyes are open with me and okay. us about five minutes ago. The team works to revive him. His sats are up at 98 too, so we're all good there. His eyes finally open. Hey sport, how you doing? Let's go. He's conscious, but he still needs urgent care. So the crew loads him on a stretcher. Brian hands him his belongings. Hey my friend, there's your glasses, don't lose those. The fellow had taken some narcotics and had become unresponsive. I'm not quite sure if he got some bystander Narcan, but when we arrived, the other paramedic crew was already here and they had given him some more Narcan. And fortunately, he wasn't down enough where he uh, needed to be ventilated. So they were able to stimulate him to breathe enough and, and give him high flow oxygen and, and he was awake. So when we actually arrived, he, his eyes were open and he was looking around. So a, a good outcome for him, luckily. You know? And uh, what's the next step for him? They're gonna run him up to the hospital uh, or to the MMU. The MMU, or Mobile Medical Unit. It's a MASH unit, a field hospital that can fold up and be transported to any emergency, just like one you would find used by the military. Rather than bringing patients to the hospital, Vancouver Coastal Health is bringing the hospital to the patients. Right now, the MMU is on Hastings Street in the heart of Vancouver's downtown east side. Dallas was brought here after he overdosed. Apparently, I was out. I couldn't breathe for five minutes or so. So after that, I feel really tired and a little bit stoned, but pretty worn out right now. Yeah, no doubt. Do you know what it was that you took? Uh, heroin. Do you think that's all was in it? No, I'm pretty sure there was fentanyl in there. Like, were you ready to put that in your system? No, I wasn't ready at first. I didn't know what it was, and until I found out what it was, and I really wanted to stop, but I couldn't. It's really bad. That's what I'm here for, trying to get some help. Help from addiction specialists like Dr. Susan Burgess. She consults patients like Dallas once the nurses stabilize them. Burgess wants to get Dallas into addiction treatment. But with fentanyl, she knows even if he gets in, the odds are stacked against him. People who were stable are going off their opioid substitutions. And we have discussions with them and, you know, are you worried? No, I kind of really like this. Even though they're a mess, they're homeless, um, they're going to die unless something changes. So. What makes this risk so severe? Just the power of the particular substances. I kind of say goodbye in my heart to my patients after I see them any time, you know. Um, you I mean, people are dying down here anyway. They're just dying more quickly now. It's now 6.50 p.m. It's paramedic Brian Twait's fifth call in an hour and a half. This one comes in as a possible cardiac arrest, which means a possible overdose. 
these overdoses, quite frankly, they look dead. So it will get defaulted to a cardiac arrest call because we're not certain. Hey guys. A woman is down. Paramedics try to stabilize her with a Narcan injection. I think she'll wake up for you? Hello. Hi. Yeah, she's still pretty deep. One, two, three. Yes. And she's opening her eyes there. Hi, hon. You're going to be okay. She's alive. Paramedics brought her back from the brink. But it's not enough. She still needs additional care. I don't know if they're going to take her to St. Paul's Hospital or if they'll take her to the MMU. But what they're providing there is fantastic. And also, it frees up emergency room beds. By midnight on Welfare Wednesday, emergency responders will have answered 33 suspected overdose calls. That's what it is down here. What you're seeing now is, is the norm. Just one call after another, and it just doesn't stop. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Long time no see, huh? OK, have a good night, eh? The brutal cost of a lifelong addiction. Oh, I've lost too many friends, too much of my family. Where your next fix could be the last. And it's the equivalent of playing Russian roulette. When W5 continues. Welcome back. Well, we've seen how the fentanyl epidemic is crushing first responders in Vancouver. Now, the desperate search for solutions, some of which would have been unthinkable only a few years ago. W5's John Woodward continues our investigation. St. Paul's Hospital is the closest emergency room to Vancouver's downtown east side, ground zero of Canada's opioid crisis. It sees three quarters of the overdose calls from the area. Patients like Jonathan. What'd you take tonight? Were you trying to kill yourself? Was this no, no. part of a suicide attempt or anything? No. Jonathan was picked up in Vancouver's West End. ER doctor Brian Lahif is trying to keep him conscious. Give me a squeeze here, Jonathan. Wake up for me, bud. What Jonathan injected was probably fentanyl, an extremely powerful and deadly narcotic. Hey, Jonathan. I think you're a, a little bit too sleepy right now. They gave you a bit of Narcan. One of your friends did. What we need to do is we need to watch you for a while to make sure that what you took is completely out of your system, okay? We'll need to get a couple of tests on you, but most important, we need to watch you for a bit, eh? Just get an IV at him. Hey, Buzz. Hey, We're going to start an IV on you, hon, okay? Yeah. yeah. I need to wake you up a little bit more, bud. Yeah. He has already received a dose of Narcan, the fast-acting injection that temporarily counteracts the effects of opioids like fentanyl. But the doctor feels he needs more. If he doesn't get the IV, the danger is he could overdose again. If the fentanyl's still on board, I want to make sure he doesn't come back and kind of and re nail you there, eh? Yeah. Jonathan is just one of more than a dozen OD cases Dr. Lahif sees every day. Fentanyl is you know, more challenging overdose to deal with than heroin, which I know sounds a bit funny, um, but they take uh, longer time, longer resources, and the risk of them sort of going downhill is bigger. Jonathan gets his IV drip. The antidote does its job. He's stable and becoming more alert. I use enough heroin to get out of pain, and that's where I stop. Once I'm out of pain, I stop using. I don't do the drug to get high. He says his pain started with two herniated discs in his back, then a torn shoulder. That was 25 years ago. He's been using heroin ever since. But recently, the drugs he's been buying have changed. They're now laced with cheaper and more powerful substances. There is no heroin around anymore. It is all fentanyl. Or its more powerful cousin, carfentanyl. It's meant for stopping a charging rhino or a stampeding elephant. And it's meant to stop them dead. Here we're fixing it, putting it in our, our bodies. I've lost a lot of family members. My street family was about 3,000. I'm probably looking at about maybe my family down to about 600. Jonathan guesses he has OD'd 25 times in the last 11 months. He's cheated death so far, but he says with his pain, he can't stop. 
I don't want to die. <laughs> oh, I've lost too many friends, too much of my family. I mean, a thousand deaths in BC last year related to opiate overdose. That's a, a pretty powerful statistic. Also, what people use, and I think that you're living in kind of a false hope if you think you know, even in a different echelon society, you think it's not going to affect you. Even, you know, within one or two degrees of separation. Um, and so I think it's closer to most people, I believe, than they would be comfortable with. Hospital drug overdose admissions in the region have almost doubled, from 4,000 visits in 2015 to 7,000 visits last year. The hospital, wrestling with the volume, has opened up a specialized addiction intake one floor above the emergency room doors. That gives patients like Jonathan the option for immediate addictions counseling and further care. Dr. Dan Calla is the head of the ER at St. Paul's. His unit faces this crisis every day. And what's causing it? Well, there's no question it's the, the product on the street. This new ultra-potent drug that uh, you know, the dealers can bring in from, I think most of it's coming from overseas and it's highly concentrated so they can bring small amounts and make a lot of money. It's a very short-sighted business plan when you kill your own clientele though. And it seems it's so potent that if you even make a small error in the production of this pill, it could be fatal. Totally, 100%, yeah. There's no room for error with this drug. If you're alone and you use every time, it's the equivalent of playing Russian roulette. How bad is this crisis? You know, in a scale, it, it, it's comparable to the AIDS crisis of the 80s. In fact, it's more than three times worse. At its peak, AIDS claimed 267 lives a year in BC. Last year, overdoses killed 922 people. Things have been bad here for a long time. Over a decade ago, authorities started Insight a supervised injection site that got an exemption from federal drug laws. Nurses here watch users inject drugs and take action if anyone overdoses. It's so popular there are often lineups and sometimes people like Clayton seek other options. I've overdosed before. Luckily, I, you know, my friends were around, but you know what happens if they're not around, right? An attitude like that has kept Clayton alive for five years. So what brings you here today? Uh, to stay clean, right? Out of the, like it's dirty outside and you know, it's a safe place. Uh, I always know in the back of my head that if anything does happen, I'm safe here, right? He's come here to what's called the pop-up tent. It's like a safe injection site, but there are no nurses. Unlike Insight, volunteers watch over users, looking for signs of possible ODs and intervening when necessary. Users bring in their own supply of drugs, sit down at tables, and inject. It began as an extension to the street market in the downtown east side, run by former businesswoman and city politician Sarah Blythe. We're right out in the open, and people you know, from the community are coming and going at all times. And uh, since we're outside, people from, you know, if there was an overdose in the neighborhood, people would run to us because we were just right out there. They knew we were trained. And so it just became more and like more and more people every day started running towards us, you know, asking us for help. It just got to the point where there were overdoses happening every day. Eventually we just said like, what the f is going on? So you took matters into your own hands? Yeah, so we basically said, we know what to do. We know that it may not be 100% a legal situation here, but we know what, what, what we can do to save lives. Today, the volunteers are watching Clayton inject what he thinks is cocaine and heroin. Two shots, two batches of unknown drugs. Tell me what you just did then. Uh, I got myself better. What, what did that mean? Getting myself unsick from the heroin withdrawal. And when was the last time before just now that you uh, Last night before I went to bed. Okay. Yeah. And do you worry about what's in the drugs you're using? Down here you don't know, right? Downtown you don't know, but um, honestly, no, honestly I don't worry about it because on, I, nothing's happened to me really, but... And how long have you been using? Since I was like 15 years old. He's a familiar face to volunteer Dave Chevelde. He's a regular, younger, um, and he does that, the double injection where they do the cocaine and then they do the down. 
Um, it is a scary mix because again you're going up and then you're, you're going down. Both narcotics are fighting each other. Sometimes, uh, especially the younger younger guys, they'll fight it. They'll actually fight their OD. Just by sheer force of will. Just sheer force, they're fighting it, fighting it, and eventually they go down. Um, but again, you know, we've never had a death. We always get everybody back. It's only been a few minutes since his injection, but Clayton wants to leave. Are you sure? Oh, it's okay. I'm not gonna stay. What's up? Volunteers are concerned. They can protect people like Clayton here, but they can't force them to stay. Yeah, I'm not doing it. I have a, like a big corner. So. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. okay. Yeah. All right. See you later. Does it worry you watching somebody like that walk into the alley? Uh, yeah, because uh, we don't have their backs in the alley. The pop-up tent supervises hundreds of injections a day. But Sarah wants to do more and take things a step further, hopefully one day to help people better manage their addictions and to stop them from using in the first place. Eventually you want something like that because it's got you know medical staff and it's got mental health workers where you can get the rehabilitation. I mean, in the end, like this is all just sort of a Band-Aid. But it's a Band-Aid that's working. When someone does OD here, volunteers are there to call for help, keeping users from dying alone on the street. A city gripped by a drug crisis. The cost of somebody using illicit opioids is enormous. Searches for a way out. Sometimes I wanted to give up. This job is not easy, right? When W5 continues, The alleys of Vancouver's downtown east side. Here, hidden among the dumpsters, the users, haunting tributes to the hundreds of lives lost. And a warning of danger. The drug that killed so many, mentioned by name, fentanyl. Nick is part of a unique cleanup crew called Spikes on Bikes. Volunteers trying to do their part, cleaning up the thousands of syringes or rigs that litter the alleys of the downtown east side. Many of those rigs are contaminated with diseases like HIV or hepatitis C. That's dangerous because users often sift through discarded needles for unused drugs, exposing themselves to further harm. Here you go. Combing the alleys for needles presents another opportunity for the crews. They come face to face with users and are able to keep an eye out for possible ODs. They're trained in emergency first aid and how to use the opioid antidote drug, Narcan. It just blocks it and it's only temporary too. They come about in five minutes. Um, I've seen them get up and, and be playing singing guitar. The one minute they're blue and the next they're like, they come right out of it, right? So it's kind of it's that fast. interesting thing to watch. Nick has his own reason to be out here. I've lost one close friend, a mother, Mary Purdy, passed away a few weeks ago uh, at her home because she wasn't at a safe injection site. How does it make you feel to know that some of those deaths happen? It broke my heart because uh, I was really close to her and I went to her funeral and told her that I'm out here. Sometimes you can't do anything, right? Uh, but I had to let them know that I'm, that I'm still doing it. And sometimes I wanted to give up. This job is not easy, right? Do you ever think as you're going through this, I'm doing this for Mary? Yeah, I think of it all the time, actually. <laughs> it seems everyone knows someone affected. John Pinkley lost a friend, too. This used to be Pinkley's home only two years ago, a tent city that has since been abandoned. There was a time where when I was fixing and I was living in a tent, and I wasn't sure what I really wanted anymore. I was tired of everything. He was homeless, spending his days and nights hustling to feed his habit. He tried to quit, but nothing worked. In this alley behind the Regent Hotel, something changed. A close friend named Joe died of an overdose on these steps. His life paralleled mine so close. And, you know, for the grace of God go I, uh, that could have been me. Because I was in this alley 
six months previous to that, I'd reached that point to where I just didn't care anymore. How close do you think you came to being on this step right here, never getting up? Uh, I, I've come close. Um, do you miss Joe? Yeah, yeah, I miss him. John knew he could have been next, and he needed help. He was accepted into an innovative program at the Crosstown Clinic. Morning. Here, he doesn't have to inject in alleys. There's no risk of fentanyl. Thank you. He doesn't have to guess what's in the syringe. Not anymore. John is using heroin legally. Medical grade prescription heroin, paid for by the government. And he credits it with saving his life. It has three syringes in it. There's one for the morning, and one for the, at lunch, and one for the evening. Um, and they're spaced apart to, uh, so that uh, my body has, gets the most out of the drug before I have to do another shot before I start to feel withdrawal, feel uh, withdrawal symptoms. John injects the prescription heroin himself. He visits three times a day and receives just enough heroin not to get high, but to fend off the symptoms of withdrawal. And he'll probably be on this drug for the rest of his life. Crosstown is the only clinic in North America offering medical grade heroin to chronic users. Patients are carefully vetted. It's a last resort. The program is only available to long-term users like John, who have unsuccessfully tried other options, like opioid replacements and counseling. Probably you've all experienced that. Nothing. Dr. Scott McDonald runs the clinic, modeled on a similar program in Switzerland. How do you know if somebody's going to benefit from treatment like this? Well, we, we know from tw 25 years of experience in, in Europe, there's a way to get people who are using illicit opioids into care so that they get healthy, they stop using street opioids, and the burden on society in terms of dollars and resuscitation and the, the burden on the police, uh, there's another option. When people are using illicit opioids, number one, it's a public health disaster. The cost of somebody using illicit opioids is, is enormous. Uh, we estimate that the cost for one person using illicit opioids is at least $48,000 a year. We can provide this treatment at this clinic for about $25,000 a year, and if you, you build into cost uh, efficiencies, you might get that down to $14,000 a year. So what you're saying is because these people are not stealing, they're not going to jail, they're not going to the hospital, we're actually saving money. Yes. Uh, and we've got solid evidence showing that. And it's only societal costs. We're not even including the cost of stolen goods, damage to uh, public property. So uh, our cost estimate is actually underestimating the real benefit to society. So if you had to add it all up with all these patients in here, how much do you think this, this clinic is saving Vancouver? Oh, already millions. Yeah. Millions yes. of dollars, yes. Crosstown has given John the opportunity to rebuild his life. He's not spending his days chasing down his next fix. He went back to school, got a job, and got his own apartment. Patricia and Jessica are two addicts that call these streets home. They want that kind of opportunity too. Patricia's a mom and wants to be stable enough to be there for her kids. When I was taking my heroin three times a day, scheduled, maintained, and not a large amount, I was using what I needed. I would, I was calm, and I was happy, and I could be around people, and I was good. Have you heard about the Crosstown Clinic where they prescribe heroin? I, I think it's an amazing program. It would be a path, I think, towards me ultimately getting clean in the future, and it would give me the, 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 the what I need for my physical ailments as well. Crosstown treats about 150 people already. Doctors estimate there's a need for as many as 500 more. But the program doesn't have the money to expand. Specialized paramedics on the ground, an army-style mobile medical hospital, prescription heroin, supervised injection sites, and volunteers learning how to save lives. It may be making a difference in the opioid crisis. In December, five people were dying every day. The numbers declined a little in early 2017, but the death rate was still 50% higher than the year before. 
And those who have to see those deaths up close, like St. Paul's ER doctor Brian Laheef, are thinking seriously about even more radical options. I don't believe that we'll ever stop people from using illicit drugs. That's pie in the sky. Every culture at every time in history has. I think that I'm growing more to think that really legalizing it, making sure that people know exactly what they're taking and they're taking precise doses, uh, is probably the best solution uh, for dealing with the, the death and the misery that these things cause. It's a revolutionary statement, legalizing drugs as strong as heroin on a large scale across the country. But with things as bad as they are here, he feels all options should be on the table. Whether that happens or not, Dr. Dan Kalla of St. Paul's Hospital says the rest of the country should be prepared to do something. What's the advice you have for them? Uh, my advice for them is prepare for it. It's coming. And don't put your head in your sand. Don't. We've had to respond on the fly here, and maybe we responded too late, potentially. But when you know this toxic, lethal drug is out there, and it will take hold in other communities, I guarantee it, um, be prepared. It's after dark, 9.46 p.m., near the end of our last night in Vancouver's downtown east side. Yet another call for emergency service, another OD. This time, the 911 call came too late. No Narcan, no resuscitation. In this body bag is 54-year-old Marcel Holland. He was found dead by a neighbor who came to check on him. Holland grew up in northern BC. He started working at 16 to help raise his five brothers and sisters. He worked 25 years as an iron worker. His sister says in 2014, he was hurt when his car was hit by a pickup truck. He never could get over the pain. His family says that's why he started using heroin. It's just so sad to see. Yeah. I live with my brother. And, um, I used to try to go see him and he wouldn't let me up there and uh, I knew what he was doing. And then uh, this time it took his life. One more death. Marcel Holland puts a face to the grim reality of the opioid crisis. The worst case scenario for any of the 53 overdoses over the past 48 hours in Vancouver. And the rush of the emergency crews goes on. On the next call, someone else may die. Another ambulance on its way to try to save another life.